Hello, everyone. Well, I'll introduce ourselves here. I'm Brad Pozorek. I'm a systems administrator with Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, um, OMRF, as you'll hear us call it. Um, I've been with OMRF for about 16 years. Um, been in most of the uh, infrastructure roles on the infrastructure team of IT, um, enterprise IT at OMRF. I'm Stuart. Um, I am essentially a sysadmin also um, with a, more of a background in, in Linux. Um, I work in the arthritis and clinical immunology department, which basically means um, I'm actually in the labs doing um, computer work for, for the labs instead of actually working for IT, um, which basically means I do anything and everything um, computer related that is not handled by IT. Um, I've been doing that for about 18 years. Um, and we're here today to kind of share our story um, uh, with, about SWIFT. So a little bit about OMRF. We are a, a located in Oklahoma City, and we are an independent nonprofit biomedical research institute um, dedicated to understanding and developing effective treatments for human disease so that others may live longer, healthier lives. Um, just a little bit about OMRF. We're about 500 full-time employees in size. Um, we run a pretty small, lean IT shop. Um, we have three system admins. Two of them are right here. Um, team of five dev apps, three help desk, security officer, CIO, that's it. Um, we all wear many hats, overlap in a lot of areas, help each other out a lot. Um, a small fact about us here is uh, that some people have a hard time believing is uh, our IT department is actually run on a $150,000 capital budget annually. It's all we're given to bust it up, divide it up. We fight for it. Networking wants it. I want it. Everyone else wants it. AV wants it. Um, everything else we have to beg for. Um, in the science side, we have about 45 lead researchers. Um, they are grant-based funded. They bring their own money in, and they really want to do their own thing. This self-funded nature of them having their own money, um, some of these labs have big money, some of them not so big. Um, it's really created an us-versus-them environment over the years. Um, we're just constantly fighting administration versus science. My role in the IT focus, uh, role, we're focused on our core applications, accounting, procurement systems, payroll, networking, email, et cetera. Um, we bring with that availability, business continuity, and a support model behind it. Um, many times this often brings project management and uh, longer deployment times to the table, much longer than what science wants to deal with. Science, like I said before, they bring their own pool of money. Um, they know what they want. They need to do an experiment. They want to get it going so they can move on to the next step, find their discoveries. Um, so they just go out and buy their stuff, stand it up, move forward down the road to science. Um, oftentimes, this, this sets up what we call shadow IT. Um, this stuff gets thrown up on lab benches and closets, um, under desks, any place they can find to stick, this, stick their, uh, their equipment. For me, it's the typical usual business business train model. Um, I run Dell Equalogic SANS for all my stuff. Um, I got two groups, a legacy group of PS6000s that I'm migrating off of, and another group, my primary group, is uh, um, also Dell Equalogic, and it's dedicated to iSCSI on one pool and SMV NAS on another pool that runs Dell FS. Um, right now, I'm down to about 11 terabyte free on my, on my NAS system, and that terrifies me. I could get a call this week that that's gone in full, um, or it might last me another couple of months. I really don't know in today's science. Um, I need to add something to that. And on the iSCSI side of it, one of my main, my main roles is uh, the Commvault backup system, where all my uh, volumes are mounted, two terabyte uh, volumes into Commvault. Well, I run disk to disk to tape, um, and I'm, I'm really, one of the, the, the key issues I had was my primary data and my backup data are all in one array. One nightmare away from being a full tape recovery. And I just can't fathom that, to be honest. So I need to find something I could grow into, expand um, as I needed it, and, and be able to do it in a, in a cost effective of, of model. So um, from the other side, what you know, I'm bringing to the table as, as a shadow IT group, um, just kind of give you an idea of what, what I had before, um, being the, the largest shadow IT presence on campus, um, 
mainly around the idea of supporting um, genomics workflows, um, sequencing mainly in the labs that I'm, I'm in right now. I run a pair of scale-out NAS systems. Um, one of them is newer, smaller, faster, and under a support contract. The other one is older, slower, larger, but not under a support contract. This leads me to spending a lot of my time copying data between it as it ages off to get it off the smaller, faster one so we have more space there to continue with our analysis. Um, so, you know, I say I have 200 to 400 terabytes of, of data. Uh, I don't really know how much I really have because it's moving around all the time. Uh, on top of all that, I, I have to, to back it up somehow. So I actually run a third NAS system um, that I, you know, basically built myself, you know, ZFS box sitting in one of these closets, um, just in another building on campus that I then replicate some of the data to again uh, as my supposed backup uh, because the amount of data we have doesn't fit into the Commvault licensing that we have. Um, and again, like I say, all of this I'm doing on my own, separated from IT. Um, you know, there's little backup for my actual data. There's no backup for me. Um, there's no cross-training. Um, it, it's, it's all on my own. And like I say, I'm just a, a small portion of, of this. I'm, small, I'm the largest portion of the shadow IT, but there are other groups. You know, there's another lab that has uh, close to 100 terabytes on a RAID 5 array. Um, there's another lab that has another RAID array that has a drive in it that's failed that they have no idea how to replace the drive on because they don't have the administrative password to that um, interface. It just sits there and blinks with a red light. Um, so uh, in getting this talk ready, I actually came across this, um, this little slide I had from one of our shares. Um, it, it's pretty old, you know, 2010, 2011 time frame. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of, of you know, what, what all this, this stuff is there for. Um, you know, this share, um, you know, we started out 2010, under five terabytes on this share. That's, you know, nothing. Um, you can see the, you know, big spike there. We get some of our first sequencing equipment in and start running experiments and start running more experiments. You know, just keeps growing. Basic story on this, um, you know, in about, about a year's time, you know, the, this, this group generated 35 terabytes of data. Contrast this with uh, this little graph from one of the shares on our, our new NAS system. And the, the thing here is um, literally last month, another lab called Brad up and told them they have 20 terabytes of data sitting on a bunch of USB portable hard drives. They got it from running one experiment in one week and they needed to do something with it. And so now what took us, you know, about a year to generate, you know, we can do in, you know, less than a week yeah. without anyone knowing. It just shows up. Um, put it somewhere. Yeah, we have to put it somewhere. So, you know, Brad's comment of, you know, 11 terabytes free on his system, you know, he considers that low. That's not low. That's empty. That, that's no capacity. Um, so what is all this hard, hardware there about and that, you know, it's all about data. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's the hockey stick, you know, whatever you want to call it. it it's always growing. Um, you know, again, this is all about doing science. You know, we, we get funding to perform experiments to try to solve diseases or whatever. Um, and, you know, like I say, we, we get that funding from our science side to perform these experiments, to generate these data. Um, but that funding may come with money for me to buy some of these NAS arrays that I've had in the past. Um, but it doesn't give you the ongoing funding to maintain that NAS array when that support contract goes up or, you know, you need to fix something that's broken in it. Um, and so, you know, it, it continues to grow because, uh, you know, the other fun thing of, of scientists is they don't want to get rid of data ever. Um, it's, it's just not in their vocabulary. You know, they've spent time, they spent money, effort to, to generate these data sets. Why, why get rid of them? What's, what's the point of that? There, there is no point of that. Um, so we're basically holding on to it forever. You know, I, I have stuff on my NAS system with timestamps before 2000. I have no idea what the data are, but they're there, and I have to continue copying them around to different systems. So, you know, I, this leads to, you know, this, this mix of, of sizes of, of, of data and then types. You know, I have big data, I have small data, um, old data, new data, raw data, you know, final papers, anything and everything, the backup data. Um, you know, virtual machines, it, it's, it's all there, um, and that's, that's what it's, we're doing for science. It's, it's all our science is data-driven now. You know, they were talking about the keynotes, you know, everything is becoming computer science. You know, the computer science stuff is coming to the, the bioinformatics space. That's, that's what it's all about. On top of all of that, 
we have to protect this data somehow. Um, you know, Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, that's Oklahoma. Um, you may think of, you know, a covered wagon, um, but Oklahoma is also known for a documentary that came out a few years ago. Some people think it's a movie, uh, Twister. Um, we are in Tornado Alley, um, so that is always a threat. And we've also um, learned of a, a new threat recently, uh, of earthquakes, actually. Um, so, you know, we, we have to do something. You know, back to my older graph there of under five terabytes. At that time, you know, my uh, disaster recovery plan was actually, I, I told my, my, uh, my investigator in my lab that, you know, if I see a tornado coming, I'll just drive down to the office and grab the drives and, you know, drive out uh, away from the tornado. That doesn't work when you have a couple of racks worth of, of NAS servers. Um, so, you know, what all this means of all this data is we, we basically grew into a mess. Um, you know, we, we had this historical warring, um, you know, on, on the bad days, just not communicating on the good days between the different departments and the different labs of, of everyone doing something on their own. Um, you know, IT runs a SAN and a NAS system, and they have their own backup, but that doesn't really work for the, the research computing side of things. Um, I run a NAS system and, and need backup, but that NAS system doesn't really work for the uh, IT side of things because my NAS system is too expensive for them, and my backups are too large for them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're competing and, and duplicating effort and, and not working together on that. And then you have, um, you know, tape. Um, you know, Brad is using tape for his backup. I actually looked into using tape for, for my archive data, for some of my science data. I had to wait in line behind the business backups to get my stuff onto the tapes. I had to wait in line behind the business backups to get my data back off of the tapes when I needed to use that data again. I had to lose my data when both of my tapes failed, even though we did this thing, you know, write everything to two copies you know, on two tapes. Both tapes failed, and so I, I lost some data there. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's stupid, is, is what tape is. Um, and, you know, on, on top of all of that, you know, we're, we're both running out of space. Um, you know, at one point last year, or year before last, um, for, for Brad's uh, dista dista tape, it came to he had no space left, and he needed somewhere for that. So I had actually given some of the space off of my science NAS. And then this question of, well, wait a second. He didn't pay for any of that. He charges me for storage, and I'm giving him storage back for free. Shouldn't I be getting some money back somehow? Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know on, on that. So. so like Sir said, we both in IT and science ran out of space. We needed storage. We needed it qu quickly. Um, I started down my ecologic path. Yeah, we'll just buy another array, slam it in, expanded. A couple hours later, I'm good to go. He went down his path, buy more isolon, slam it in, expand. He's off to his uh, science quickly as well. But what are we really doing there? We're paying and maintaining two independent systems. The cost is enormous to the foundation, to a nonprofit foundation. Stuart and I came together. We started talking. It's like, why, why can't we do this together? There's got to be something out there that we could both put in on, that it could be useful to both of us, could be usable to both of us, still perform it for him, cost effective for me. Um, how do we move forward with this? With this? Um, so we both, we went off, got our, our, our brought our normal traditional uh, quotes to the table, eliminated them quickly, looked at some other scalable um, systems, um, and really OpenStack Swift quickly became the front runner um, in utilizing Swift Stack as its front end management system. Some of these initial wins that we had on it was my comp vault environment was very easy, very simple to, to deploy. Um, it accepted it very well, performed very well, and SwiftStack had great comp vault documentation already out there for me. Um, provided an excellent pay-as-you-grow model. Um, we, as we fill it up, we just you know, put in more commodity dish drives, expand it as we really need it. Um, my CFO loves this idea, um, and the COO really loves that science and administration have come to the same table and are working together instead of fighting each other so much. Um, one of my other big wins here is uh, it has 3x replica. It's helping to eliminate my tape environment completely. Um, and, and really, for the first time ever, I have a third location offsite and an actual DR facility that I can set up a Commvault DR replication center, something I've never been able to do without having to buy a whole other system down there and an array and storage down there to replicate to. Science immediately got it online and were able to move off 50 terabyte of data immediately to an archive 
off of their Isilon system to immediately ingest more science and, and get running fast. Kind of how this came together was in August of 2015. Um, we put in our initial order. Um, it was for six nodes. Um, we did reuse one JBOD system to help initially save some money up front in our third backup region. Um, it was about 250 terabytes total of, of disk and then license purchase uh, from Swiss Stack. Um, roughly uh, six months later, uh, Stuart got a new project online, a new grant awarded for 100 more terabyte of disk and license and two more chassis for a, a separate genome project that his lab was running. And then our third major expansion was another 50 terabytes. Um, just earlier this year, three more chassis nodes, again, off of a grant that he was awarded. And then I brought to the table the drives to, fill, uh, to start filling up those chassis. And then over the course of the whole year, as we've approached the best practices guidelines or needed more expansion, Enterprise IT has been able to fund that license and those drives, sometimes even sneaking drives in as office supplies. So a little bit more details on you know, how that's all done um, hardware-wise. Um, like I say, we're using Swift there, um, standard 3x replica. So we have three zones in, in two regions. Um, I say regions here in quotes because um, initially one of those regions was, again, in a closet in another building on campus. Um, you know, standard white box, um, super micro things. You know, again, nothing fancy, save money, just um, for you um, chassis couple SSDs for boot, a couple SSDs for your account container, um, and then slammed full of um, drives for everything else. Um, we actually run a mix of drives. Um, you know, we reused some SAS drives we had previously. We've bought um, various SATA drives over the time, and the last time we actually um, expanded some drives, the SAS drives were cheaper for us at the time, so we actually slammed in more SAS drives. Um, we honestly spend more time when it comes to expand drives bitching back and forth over what drive to buy, what's going to be the cheapest, what do we think is going to last the longest. Um, you know, we spend a week or more going back and forth looking at that than it takes to put the drives in um, when we expand it. You know, we're using, for the most part, they're all commodity consumer drives, um, which you know, can fail, obviously, uh, as anything and everything does. So the, the extra thing we're doing that is using the, the full disk encryption, you know, the Linux full disk encryption, so the drives themselves are, are fully encrypted. We did this for a couple of reasons. One, when we first um, did our install, Swift did not have native encryption. Two, it's just easier to keep it that way now, and we don't have to care about the drives at all. Um, they're, you know, they're throwaway. Everything on there is completely protected if you don't have the key. And you know, we have, you know, genomic data is considered, you know, personal identifiable information, um, so we have to protect it. And so. We pull that drive out of the chassis, it's useless to anyone else without the key. And we actually, for our one failure so far of a drive, we actually, for fun, went ahead and did the standard consumer RMA replacement on it, mailed it back to Seagate or Western Digital, whoever it was, and you know, they sent us another one. And, and you know, it didn't matter um, what was on there. Um, for performance reasons, you know, we're using read write affinity, so we're targeting the local um, nodes in our local region. And, just to, to maintain the performance, and then everything else, you know, obviously will, will um, replicate offsite eventually. Um, we started out with just simple round robin DNS between all the nodes because we were going with a full um, proxy account container on each node. Um, that was done to meet some price, um, performance, and capacity requirements. Um, we couldn't afford to do a, a dedicated proxy tier, and we're continuing with it without the proxy tier just because it's easier to have every node do everything. Uh, everything's the same. Um, later on, we added in load balancing um, through the Swift Stack um, controller, which is what we're using to, to do all the management of everything. So for anyone kind of graphically minded in the, in the audience wants to see a pretty picture, um, you know, here's some lines uh, of everything. Um, so we have our two regions. Or, uh, one is in our main office in Oklahoma City. Um, we sit on uh, an Oklahoma City campus of the local university. The main campus is about 20 miles away down in um, Norman in Oklahoma, and they actually have their own fiber between the two and are nice enough to let us utilize that. So um, we actually have 10 gig down to our offsite uh, now since um, that's been moved down there last month. Our two local zones, you know, on opposite sides of the data center, um, that's all plugged into my um, high performance computing 10 gig network. And then, you know, I'm able to bridge out to the, to the OMRF network now, so, you know, I'm, I'm not separated by a, a little Linksys NAT router um, between my, my connection out there. 
and then obviously the, the Swiss stack controller um, you know, manages all that for us. So you know, Commvault and everything else then talks in. So what does all that you know, fancy hardware actually get us? Um, these are a couple of graphs I pulled from the, um, the monitoring system um, shortly after we actually stood it up. And um, the top one here is um, actually our um, HPC doing some test analysis. And you know, we were able to pull out a gigabyte per second of our archive data to reanalyze it. And then um, we were able to push in about 600 megabytes per second, um, which for me really kind of turned it from just a, a cold archive to an active archive tier. Um, you know, it, it turned into something that's useful enough to, to do all our normal analysis from. The, the other side of this um, collaboration with the IT department, which um, is a traditional Windows-focused IT department, um, whereas, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I have a Unix, Linux background, open source, you know, none of that stuff is a big deal for me. But to, to get something like um, this um, into to the IT department, um, you know, was a little bit of a sell. Um, the, the couple things that, that made that easier, um, some Ansible scripts up front, just a couple playbooks to, to do the basic stuff to set up your Linux uh, and do our work for you know, encrypting the hard drives. Um, so Brad can run one playbook that will add a new node, um, get it all provisioned, ready to go, and then when he adds drives in at any time, another playbook will find those new drives and, and throw our keys on it. The other big thing with that uh, is the Swiss stack controller, actually. Um, you know, like Brad said, we all wear many hats. Um, on our hat rack, none of those hats is full-time OpenStack operator. Uh, it's, you know, none of our hats are even full-time storage operator. There, there's too much other stuff to do. And so having the Swiss stack there to actually do all the work of installing, configuring, managing, um, and then most importantly actually have a support number to call if something goes wrong or, or there's a question, um, which um, came up last year when uh, I configured a couple things a little, little strangely, adding in some drives, and then immediately went on paternity leave. So having a number to call and take care of that um, made things easier for, for the IT department. And the other thing that the Swift Act gives us is um, we're not running the full OpenStack suite. So you know, we, we're using just the standard auth um, from there, but they have an integration with Active Directory, which then um, you know, just from a, a simple couple of radio buttons lets um, the IT department manage all of the, the access and control straight out of Active Directory like they're, they're normally used to using. There's no other different tool. Um, and so this is just a quick shot of, of some of the accounts we have set up. So we can define all of our accounts to access our different um, scientific archives straight in Active Directory, manage all the, the control. Um, nothing, nothing weird for, for anyone to, to have to do. So as, as Brad mentioned, we got it set up you know, in a week. We shoved the, the Commvault data in there. We shoved my initial archive data in there. You know, that, that solved our initial pain points. But you know, any storage can you know, do that and ingest some data. There's, there's nothing big there. And so what comes next is you know, start using some of the, the fun stuff that you get with Swift. You know, um, you know, do some programming against it. Um, so what I started playing with was first start just using some other stuff that can you know, talk to Swift. Um, stand up a quick Docker registry. You know, everyone, Docker, Docker, Docker. You know, everything's in a container. Um, it's got a, a backend for, for its persistence straight in Swift. So you know, that, was, that was easy enough. Um, from there, it start to, um, I put on my developer hat and start to actually program against the, the API. So the, the first thing I did was just kind of get familiar with the, you know, getting and putting. And so I actually wrote a, a quick backend for, for Hashi Vault uh, for some secret stores. So again, that's, that's not too fancy, get and put objects, nothing, nothing fun there. Um, Next thing is start using it for some real business cases. Um, for me, in, in the, the sequencing core, we regularly um, send 50 to 500 gigabytes out to customers. Previously, I was having to, again, manually copy this over into another share that was on a publicly accessible web server, send out a link to someone, then remember in a couple of weeks to go back and delete that stuff from my share because it was sitting on my NAS system. You know, what does Swift have that can help me with this? Swift has a thing where you can expire data. So another quick script that I can you know, tell it, here's a set of data, send it to this email address. It will create a container for me, upload all that data to the container. As it uploads, set a delete flag in you know, whatever time frame I tell it. And you know, then they get a link to a randomly named container and um, they can download the data. And I don't have to think about it. It just gets cleaned up afterward. And if they don't get their data, that's their problem because that's our policy. That's a policy thing, so it doesn't matter for that. Um, so. The next thing I started playing with in, in Swift was the temp URLs. 
Um, and for that, what I started doing was um, I actually wanted to start backing up some of my other systems, but I didn't want to go tie into a Com Vault license. And I just had you know, a couple small files on systems I wanted to back up. And normally, you know, that would be, okay, there's, there's different things that can do backups and do it to a, a cloud object, but you have to give it credentials and save credentials in a credential file. That then means if someone get those credentials, they could have access to that container. And they could read whatever data you've put in there or delete whatever data you've been in there. Uh, I don't trust anything. So I don't want my credentials sitting out on another system, even though it's in my own firewall. Um, so I actually wrote a quick service that basically would hand out temp URLs on another authentication token. So I can just one off back up things to a temp URL. It's just, you know, I get a put URL for five minutes that's completely random based on another key. And again, it was just something quick and, you know, a day worth of hacking something together as, as fun. From there, you know, like I said, um, we have uh, the ability to use this as, a, as an active archive pull our analysis data straight from it. And you know, if you remember back to the Active Directory image, I have a lot of groups, and that was just part of it um, that was there, which means basically we're, we've taken the approach to break up all our archives into separate projects and groups so we can more easily identify them and control access and know how much space they're using for any sort of chargeback stuff we may have to do in the future, which means my users need to know what they have access to, and more importantly, they have to be able to access it with their Active Directory credentials. Again, I don't want them putting, well, I don't really care, but Brad doesn't want them putting their Active Directory password into you know, some sort of environment file. So again, a, a quick um, little, little script of a program to interact with some of the authentication APIs to get the list of tenants that are available and set up you know, your basic um, auth tokens so you can um, then do some analysis, which then leads you to, okay, I don't want my users to manually have to download the files, run their analysis, because a lot of our analysis software doesn't actually speak HTTP. You know, it wants a standard file system, so we still have to pull these objects out. Um, again, I don't want them to manually download them, run their analysis, forget to delete that files, because now I have the file sitting on my file system again, wasting all that NAS space. So another, a quick script that basically you can name an object or a set of objects and a, and a standard Unix command, it'll pull it down, pipe it through, run the stuff, and um, you know, delete the file behind you. And, you know, just a quick thing of you know counting the lines in a file. So you know all that just a couple of days of you know playing around with some some development stuff. So it's all you know sunshine rainbows great stuff. But you know there there are some troubles along the way. You know biggest thing is you know workflow stuff of you know getting people familiar with the idea of objects. Um, you know how to use that and then you know how do we want to use it? What's the best way to set up our containers and 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 projects? Um, that kind of then bleeds into some user error. Um, like I said, I, I had user error from the admin sign of adding stuff too fast, um, but I also have a user error from the standpoint I live in fear of, yes, the data are 3x replica, but if I accidentally do a curl delete to the wrong thing, I could you know, delete all my, my data. Um, and so you know, we're getting around that right now with you know, different accounts that have read and write access. Um, the other problem was, like I said, the offsite. You know, it took us over a year to actually identify a location that we could A, afford, B, was far enough away, and C, had enough bandwidth. Um, th this little picture here is when we were doing some experiments um, on site using uh, virtual PFSense to see if we could encrypt the data enough and have enough bandwidth, and then how slow we could get it. And the, the virtual PFSense did fine encrypting with a, an IPsec tunnel for what we needed to do. And then as we were slowing that bandwidth down, you know, we found at about 500 megabit, we would fall behind on the replication too far. So we knew we, you know, how much we needed to, to, to have to, to actually do that. Going forward, um, you know, the, like, like Brad said, the CFO loves the, um, the cheap and he wants all the stuff actually off the expensive NAS systems now. So, you know, we're looking at can we tier off of that? You know, my Isilon has a thing where it can automatically tier, which would be nice, and now all the users could use it. It technically only use, uh, supports public clouds like um, S3, which then makes me think, well, maybe I could plug into the, you know, the Swift S S3 stuff. Um, but then I'm tied into using that proprietary system forever. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to what comes along with proxy FS um, to just skip the NAS altogether. The other thing is, is the metadata aspect of it. All the scientific data I put in there has tagged with you know, the, the investigator, the sample, the disease, the project, the grant number, anything and everything we may ever want to look on. And so to now put a, a search engine in front of that so other investigators on campus can discover what data are already available to them. 
Um, the other, the last thing I want to start to kind of developing is, is play with some middleware, actually. Um, you know, I have a, like I said, I, I fear myself just accidentally deleting something wrong. So I want to just do a simple, simple worm-like middleware of if you do any destructive operation, just have to have an extra HTTP header on, on your client's call. Um, just something real simple. And so really what has that brought us to now that we're collaborating, we're doing everything together? Um, it's no longer us versus them, it's us and them um, working together going forward. Um, we're fleshing out our shadow IT departments, really encouraging them to pull in, into us, giving them the, the 3X replica, the disaster recovery, um, the business continuity aspects, um, and, and, and hopefully saving them money in the long run by not having to buy this stuff out up front and, and putting more money back into their scientific researches. Um, some of the takeaways, in this, uh, real quick, um, so far we've got about 420 terabyte of object data um, sitting in three regions. Um, we've come together and presented a viable joint effort utilizing OpenStack Swift and SwiftStack as the, as the front end management and proved not only can it work, and science and administration can work together, but we did it providing a more cost efficient model, providing more benefits that can be achieved, again, like I said, with more traditional storage efforts. Um, I will say personally up front that this was a very daunting project initially. Um, as it came, as Stuart brought it to me, being traditionally a Windows environment, traditionally trained, but uh, Swift has not been so bad, and um, really the Swift stack portion has brought a great sense of ease to me. Thank you. Any questions? Very interesting talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can you say a few words about how you manage the, um, the distribution of resources between sort of operations and the, and the mission side? Um, in terms of like, are you working this as a condo, or how, uh, how, how are you dividing the costs for long-term maintenance and, and uh, provision of capability? Um, on this, on this OpenStack model, well, we kind of well, who bought the last round? Who gets the next round? Type thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a mix. Um, so the the initial purchase. You know, that was kind of a 50-50 split. You know, we both needed it, and we were both going to supposedly get, you know, half of that 250 terabyte that we initially bought. Um, you know, since then, you know, some of those expansions, um, again, just kind of the way some of the stuff works, it's easier for the science side with their larger grants to buy the chassis, the big, you know, you have to get the whole chassis at a time, even if it's empty, which is a sizable cost. Um, and so we've gotten some of those, and then we get capacity at that. And then, you know, like Brad said, it's, it's easier for them to kind of buy drives one off on their own. I and can then, bury those in operating expenses. Yeah, he can put those under his budget. And so um, long term, what we've worked out with the administration is, is they'll maintain the, the licenses going forward is the idea. Um, and then, you know, what we're presenting to our other investigators is, you know, like the guys that had, you know, 20 terabytes of USB. Okay, you know, we can either just take those USB drives and slam them in there or you can buy other drives. You know, bring your drives to us. We'll put it in there, we'll cover the rest of the cost, um, again, to try to get these data out of the labs, out of the closets, um, and, and something that's protected. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yep. no, okay. Uh -oh. Do you, uh, and this maybe goes back to the same question of how do you break up costs. Do you use the accounts to sort of group like projects or departments? Can you see like how much storage is in this account over the past, you know, month or six months or something like that? Yeah, um, actually, that's, that's again, kind of why I have so many accounts um, set up, for, you know, accounts from the, the Swift Stack, um, Swift level, is with the Swift Stack um, interface, it can and easily uh, give a report back in terms of the usage um, by the top level account without having to go in and run um, extra, you know, uh, accounting against containers individually. So we can say, okay, this project is named by this investigator for this purpose. Um, so we can know exactly, okay, um, you know, investigator X, you're using this total against these, you know, five accounts that you have in there for your five different projects. Thanks for your talk. Um, you, you mentioned that you have, I think you termed it an eternal retention policy. Have you, um, have you used different uh, storage policies to kind of create like cold tiers for moving data to? And does, does the use case you have lend itself to, to doing that? 
Um, for, for most of the stuff at this point, no. Um, I do have um, some different Swift um, policies for, for the, the customer delivery. Uh, I am using uh, just a 2x replica for that one because I don't care about their data. Um, I'm, I probably shouldn't say that in case anyone wants to use our services. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, I don't need to make that third replica because, again, it's a short-lived thing that's just going to go out, so I'm only using 2x on that. But, but for everything else, um, we haven't done much um, exploration of other, of other policies, you know, erasure codes or anything like that. Um, that's one of the things I am actually waiting for is, um, you know, multi-region uh, aware erasure code. So, you know, maybe we could move that for some of the really old backup data, but still have, be sure that there's enough off-site to, to fully recover if it comes up. Good stuff. Um, we're kind of looking at something similar, and one of the questions that we have is, and it may relate to the volume of data you're dealing with, if you're having a relatively high load on the environment, and then you lose your link to your offsite, and your main site goes down, and you're relying on your offsite, and then the offsite and the online, they both eventually come up and have to resynchronize and how long something like that takes, or is, or is the amount of data that you're loading low enough that they can get back into sync relatively quickly? Our, our daily churn is low enough at this point um, that it, it hasn't been an, an issue. Um, like, like I said, you know, it was just three weeks ago, four weeks ago, that we actually did the get the stuff off-site. And so you know, that third region was completely offline for you know, 24 hours as we drove it down. You know, I had to unhook it the day before so I could get everything unracked, and we had to throw it all in trucks because we were cheap. To, we can't hire people to do it. We had to do it ourselves um, and, and physically drive it all down there and hook it all back up. And so it was offline, and, you know, and everything came back um, and, and resynced um, you know, relatively quick. It wasn't an issue. You know, our daily, you know, the Commvault stuff you know, is, is the biggest driver of daily churn usually. Um, and, and it hasn't been an issue. You know, I don't know if we'll get a big, you know, another big whole genome project and have, you know, 70 terabytes show up, you know, in a, in a week or something and, and have to put that in, but it's supposedly a 10 gig link and we can use it all, so we'll just let it churn for a while. Cool, thanks. Chris. So at this point, all the data we're putting in, you know, the scientific side is, you know, technically private to our own investigators. Um, but I mean, that is something that, that would definitely be something to look at is turn it into a repository, um, you know, and make that, you know, wider available if, you know, it, it you know, can be or, or agreed to by that uh, investigator. No more? Okay. All right. Thank you.